All right, and officially welcome everyone to our Struggle for Justice uh, teacher workshop this evening. My name is Brianna White. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I am a white woman with sort of um, strawberry, blonde, brown, curlyish hair. Um, sitting in a room with yellow walls and a Cezanne poster behind me. Um, and Irina, will you introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be with you all this evening. My name is Irina. I work with Brianna in the education department at the Portrait Gallery. I am a white woman with shoulder length brown hair and a green sweater on. And I am sitting in front of white walls with a small um, white bookshelf to the right of me. Excellent. Thank you. So we are really excited to be spending the next hour um, with you talking about um, our struggle for justice. And Irina is going to get to what our struggle for justice, what this project is in just a moment. Um, but I do want to just call your attention to the warm up question on the screen, which is what does struggle what does the idea of struggle for justice mean to you? And I am going to go ahead and move us along to our agenda for this evening. So in just a moment, Irina is going to explain what this project is. Um, and there are a whole bunch of resources associated with it that we will be sure to um, link into the chat over the course of our hour, but I will also follow up with an email tomorrow with these same resources as well. So don't feel like you have to copy and paste links um, throughout this program. As we do with all of our programs, um, we are going to start with a very quick conversation about the elements of portrayal, um, the visual clues that we use um, in portraits to tell the story of the portrait. Um, and then Irina and I are going to um, read two portraits with all of you. Um, one of the portraits is in the Struggle for Justice exhibition, which is not to be confused with our Struggle for Justice project, but certainly inspired by, um, as well as a portrait in the Outwin exhibition, which is um, our Outwin Bucci River portrait competition. Um, it's a triennial portrait competition held every three years. Um, and then we're going to think about making connections between these two portraits that we're going to be taking a close look at um, and then follow up with an activity um, for a few minutes for you all on your own to be looking at um, images from the project and thinking about ways that you might use them with your students. Um, and then Keeping our fingers crossed, we'll have enough time at the end um, to do a little bit of sharing and a little bit of reflection. But if you have attended these workshops with us um, over these past few years, you know that sometimes we just run out of time. So we are going to do the very best we can, um, but we'll try and we'll try and get to the share and the reflect at the end. All right, with that. Irina, do you want me to say anything before I play this or just play it first? Um, sure, we can just play it first. Okay. Uh, and I see some great comments in the chat about what um, struggle for justice means to everyone. Um, and I just wanna pick out a few. Um, so someone said the desire for people who have all too frequently not received uh, justice to finally have access to justice in all aspects of their life. Um, someone else says constantly having to defend being valued, safe and respected, um, working to create a community that values everyone equally and shows inequalities. Um, so I'm seeing some some overlap here in in the answers and also some differences. And I'm interested to continue this conversation as we look at these portraits. Um, and see if our definitions change or um, if how we're looking at, at um, this struggle for justice in different ways. Uh, but yeah, Brianna, take it away with, with okay. the video. Okay. This is, 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 this
That video is a short little introduction to a project that the Portrait Gallery is currently working on called Our Struggle for Justice. Um, and as a response to the murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and the racial unrest of 2020, the Portrait Gallery developed the Our Struggle for Justice campaign with Capital One. And this campaign um, serves to delve into the museum's collections to contextualize the pursuit of freedom and activism in the United States. And with this, we hope to spark conversation and inspire action. Um, and this campaign, as you might have noticed in the video, it draws from the Portrait Gallery's collections, um, including the permanent exhibition, The Struggle for Justice. Um, and the struggle for justice celebrates pioneers and change makers in the fight for social equality and the our struggle for justice campaign has two has two components a digital component and an in person component the digital component is a post on Instagram every week that features a portrait from the portrait gallery's collections. Um, and each post starts with a thought provoking question, which we hope will spark a conversation either in the comments or among friends or family or students that this person is connected to who is reading the post um, and kind of reframe the way we think about activism and the causes that are closest to us. And the in-person component, um, not only are we hosting this workshop, but uh, Brianna and I are hosting a teen workshop and um, with other colleagues, um, we are putting on a public program, which is which we're calling a day of action and will be centered around Martin Luther King Jr. holiday weekend, which is traditionally known as a day of action um, and service in our communities. Um, and in that day of action, we're going to invite local organizations and college students from around the DC area to come into our museum in our co-god courtyard and kind of activate the space and create space for taking um, actionable steps for social justice to learn about the stories of the people that have shaped the United States in our collection and have a closer conversation about um, what we can all do to to make this world and make this country a better place. So that is a quick little introduction and I will pop into the chat our homepage of this project if you're interested in learning more. Great, thank you, Irina. Um, and what better way to um, kick us off than to take a look at this really amazing portrait of John Lewis, um, which uh, is showcased um, right as you enter the exhibition. Um, I will also say before I forget um, that we have just recently created a teaching poster um, of this John Lewis portrait along with another portrait that's in the Portrait Gallery's collection of John Lewis. Um, and so at the end of um, our time together, I'm going to put my email address into the chat for all of you. And if getting this teaching poster is something that is of interest to you, please email me your mailing address and I will get that out to you um, within the next week or so, okay? Um, so that's just a little teaser of, of things to come. Um, but as, as we look at this John Lewis painting, which dates from 2020, um, this was the, the last formal portrait of Lewis uh, that was created before he passed away. Um, we see lots of really wonderful details in this piece. And as I said previously, those details are what we call the elements of portrayal, the visual clues that are in portraits um, that you need to tease out if you wanna be able to tell the story of the portrait. So as you look at this portrait of John Lewis, of Congressman Lewis, 
what are the visual clues that you see that you feel have meaning in order to be able to tell a part of John Lewis's story? And I would love if you would share your responses in the chat. So what are the visual elements, the visual clues that you see that can help us tell Lewis's story? All right, so we have someone who says the lines around him and the unhemmed edges of his suit. Okay, so really thinking about um, the artistic style, right, of, um, of the artist and what the artist is trying to convey about Lewis, right? And Susan is mentioning that his mission is unfinished. Exactly. So those those lines, those rough lines, that unfinished quality are really thinking about his um, the things that he was trying to strive for in his lifetime remain unfinished. Have others popping in like his clothing. Um, and yes. the pin, right, which is like the some objects. Yeah. And Lindsay says his structure. I don't know, Lindsay, are you like, are you talking about his pose in this portrait? Is that what you mean by structure? And Lindsay, you can feel free to either unmute or add into, ah, yes, and, okay. <laughs> so his pose, okay, excellent. He's standing tall, he's wearing a dark suit. His face, so facial expression, definitely is helpful in telling the story of John Lewis in this portrait. Excellent. Right, and that I empty see, oh, white space. Is yes. that what you were going to say, Irina? <laughs> yes, two people are mentioning that. Yeah. Right, and so that empty white space, right, really is, it's, it's, our, it's our background in this case, but it also is, um, it becomes our setting, or in this case, a lack of setting. But speaking of that white space, I'm always drawn to what looks like a, a white ledge that um, Lewis's right arm is resting on. Um, and it's so pronounced when you're looking at the, the portrait in person. All right. So these are our elements. Um, consider them to be your toolkit, right? And I think that we've we've touched on a good number of them. Um, we've touched on expression, um, clothing, pose. When we also consider the the subject within the portrait, we think about hairstyle as well. Um, we've touched on the colors that we see: that white background, that navy blue suit, um, and they're a nice contrast with each other. Um, objects. So, for instance, that flag lapel pin our setting, or in this case, lack of setting. We didn't talk about scale at all. And you can think about scale in two different ways. One is the size of the portrait itself. Um, and this portrait, Irina, what do you think? Is it, it's about three, three feet tall, maybe? Maybe two feet wide? Does that sound about yeah, right? Yeah, I would say it's like three or four. Okay. It's pretty, it's pretty big. Um, right. I'm going to put a link. Thank you. That has the dimensions in it. Yeah. Um, and then when we also think about scale, we think about the, the amount of space that our subject takes up within the actual portrait itself. Um, artistic style, we certainly touched on. Um, and then in this case, right, the medium is, um, is oil paint. So these elements right? They are your toolkit. They are the way that we um, look at portraiture and break it down in order to make meaning out of it. Um, I would also say, and some of you have definitely heard me say this over time, that, you know, these elements can be used when looking at other objects, ephemera, 
primary sources, um, you name it. Um, they are a good sort of first step, um, a good foundation um, when doing all of that really great close looking. So Irina and I have, as I said before, we've chosen two portraits um, that you'll see once you've seen both of them that they are certainly connected. Um, and we've chosen these portraits partially because of the connection, but also to really think about this idea of um, looking back in order to look at the present. Um, and that's something that the Portrait Gallery does a lot with our collection is how can we connect stories that have come before with what is happening right now, right? So how can we create these, um, these threads and these through lines? And one way that we think about threads is through Project Zero thinking routines. Um, and if you're not familiar with them, I would highly encourage you to um, to take a deep dive um, into their website. They have a lot of really wonderful routines that you can use when looking at art, when reading primary sources, when doing a whole host of things. Um, but one of their most recent projects was Arts as Civic Commons. Um, and so you see two routines up on the screen right now. One is called Values, Identities, Actions. Um, and that is a routine for exploring rich civic as aspects of a work of art. And the other one is See, Think, Me, We, which is a routine for connecting to the bigger picture. Some of you might have heard of See, Think, Wonder. Um, so while Irina and I are not going to take you through these routines as they are on the screen right now, we really were inspired by some of the questions that you see up here. So we wanted to introduce you to the routines so you know that we are going to be coming to some of these questions when we're taking a look at our two artworks. Okay. Um, and again, Irina, if she hasn't already, we'll put um, a link to Arts of Civic Common in the in the chat. Thank you, Irina. All right, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Irina. All right, so this is the first portrait that we are going to look at today. Um, and this is a pretty big portrait. This is about four and a half feet tall um, and about two and a half, three feet wide. So if you were to walk up to this portrait, um, it, it would be pretty large, but um, but before we talk about it in more detail, I want to start with a close looking. So I want everyone to take about 15 seconds to uh, look at this portrait and make some visual observations. So anything that you see in this portrait, I would love for you to put in the chat. So take about 15 seconds. And then we'll put some observations in the chat. All right, so let's get started with some visual observations. This painting is called The Return to Aslan um, by the artist Alfredo Aragon. So what, what do you notice in this, in this painting, in this portrait? All right, you have some good eyes, Ella. Um, those are very good eyes. Yes, so we're seeing, we're seeing some smaller faces, right? Almost in a grid-like pattern, um, kind of um, covering this entire portrait. It's a great observation. Um, thank you, Brianna. Yes, we see a lot of color in this portrait, right? We see reds and blues and purples and greens um, and browns. There definitely is a lot of a lot of color in this portrait. Um, okay, yes, uh, that's an interesting observation. The mosaic, the observation of mosaic looks like mosaic tiles. Um, we did this. Uh, program in person and there was someone who also said um, it looks like a mosaic and it certainly does look like a mosaic um, with right there are smaller faces creating larger faces 
Plus there's the eagle okay. at the top. Yes, we see the eagle at the top. And we also see the five, the five um, people in this portrait. Um, great observation. And I know that, um, right, we've already seen the, the idea of mosaic and tiles, but um, another word that uh, I just saw come up was it almost looks quilt-like as well. Mm, right. There are different kind of different pieces coming together to make to make something to make something larger. Yeah, I like that that adjective there. Yeah, and also we have some words and um, Brianna, if you want to move to the next slide, I've included some um, up close shots of this portrait so you can really get a look at at some of the details. And in these details, you can see some of the words, some of the lettering that's here. Um, and something great about this portrait is that it says the names of the sitters, which we don't often see in portraiture. So on the left here, right, we see the name Hildago. On the right, we see the name Morales. And if we move to the next slide, we can see the names of the other three people which are Chavez, right, Cesar Chavez, Emiliano Zapata, and Dolores Huerta. Her name is also in here. Um, and so we have quite a lot of um, ideas and images coming together to tell a story. So um, when we look at this portrait, what, um, what is, um, what is the story that is that the artist is trying to tell us? So we're we're looking at the style, right? The colors, the patterns, the lines, um, and in what way do they do they connect these these five these five faces? Irina, should I go back to the? Um the main portrait so everybody can see. That would be great. Okay. Everybody bear with me. Okay. So maybe we can take a step back and we can look at how the the artist Alfredo Aragreen um, looks at color and lines and form. So we've noticed the color in this portrait, right? Um, so how, how does the artist use color in this portrait? I'm always curious, Irina, the, um, right, as, as, as I put into the chat, the, the red, the blue, and the green, to me, stands out more than any other color, although there are certainly colors that um, are in there in different tones of the reds, the blues, and the greens, right? There's some purples, there's some pinks, um, but what I don't see in there um, are the, you know, the oranges and the yellows, um, so much, right? They're more of a, a secondary. And yeah, so I, do, right. I wonder... we have... Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> right. Like, no, that's a, that's a good wondering, a good question, right? Like the artist chose these colors very specifically um, in, in this painting. Um, and so we kind of have like blocks of color somewhere. Some of the other colors are more blended in, but they, they come together to create these five faces of these people and an eagle um so, and deborah has a great a great comment here so not only do we have colors and symbols in this portrait but we also have we also have the names and how the artist has chosen to represent um these people not only in their name but also right we can look at we can look at how they are represented as a as people in in this portrait right so um, Deborah, you point out that um, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta are named with their first names, but the others only have their last names. So something to think about, right? Why do Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez have their first names here? And that also points me to the structure of this painting, right? Here at the top, um, we have two 
two uh, figures at the top, which are a little bit smaller. Their names are Miguel Hildago and Jose Maria Morales. And both of these, um, both of these men lived in the 1810s, around the 1810s, um, in the 19th century. And they were, they were leaders of, um, of the Mexican, of the Mexican American War and the War of Independence. Um, and so they they kind of represent this historical past. And then as we move down the, the portrait, we see Emiliano Zapata, who is in the middle. Um, he was also a leader in the Mexican Revolution. Um, and then as we move to the left and to the right of him, we see Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, who we might think of as someone, some people who are more contemporary, right? Dolores Huerta is still alive. Um, and she worked very closely in the 1950s and the 1960s, specifically with Cesar Chavez. So we kind of have this outline, maybe a family tree of, of these people in this portrait. So why do you think um, the artist has included these five people in this portrait? What values is he trying to pull out of this portrait? Or what values are you getting from this portrait? We did also have a comment, Irina, about um, Zapata seems to be wearing the main colors of the Mexican flag, red, white, and green. That's a great observation. Yeah, another another way, right, to symbolize what, what I think Erica is leading us towards, right, is the connecting the past to the present, right? Um, Alfredo Araguin has has put in the two these two um, these two leaders of the 19th century in Mexico. And then he also has included contemporary leaders and leaders that are important to Mexican history. Um, and so we see, right, we see, um, we see history here. Um, maybe we see justice, right? Uh, many of these figures fought for justice. What other values do you see represented in this portrait? I keep thinking about, um, I know Erica mentioned the connecting past to present, but when we think about, you know, these, these subjects and that we're looking at this um, huge span of time, um, I can't help but to think about this idea of um, the legacy, right? Their legacy, but also the, the this bigger legacy um, of, of activism that's being represented here. Yeah, legacy is a great word to, to kind of describe what is being represented here. Also kind of along with that is maybe tradition, right? Or the right, as Erica said, looking at the past. Um, so they're right, there's a lot of looking, looking backwards and also forward. Um, yeah, that's great. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit um, about Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, if you're unfamiliar with them. Um, so Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, they came together in the early 1960s. Um, they were both seeing how unfairly um, farm workers in southern United States and specifically California were being treated. Dolores Huerta was a teacher and, um, and Cesar Chavez, they came together to form the United Farm Workers Union. Um, and this union um, came together to combat injustice towards migrant workers in California and the Southwest. And Huerta and Chavez, um, they organized what was called the Delano Grape Boycott. Um, and it was the most widespread uh, protest in 1965. Um, and they protested, they boycotted table grapes. And they put pressure on the California grape industry to change its unfair practices, um, practices of safety practices of uh, wages, fair wages for all of the farm workers. Um, and after five years, the boycott proved successful. 
um, and conditions for, uh, for workers and the benefits were secured. Um, and so Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, right, are these, um, these icons of, of justice um, of, in the 1950s and 60s, um, along with um, a time period, right, that was filled with, with um, struggles for justice for many different groups. Um, and so here we have um, a portrait of Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez with with um, people of the past, people who came before them. Um, and as the artist says, the painting celebrates the traditions of independence and social justice that has been essential in the development of Mexican and Chicano identities. Um, and so I think that's a great kind of quote to end on and to move on to our next portrait. Yeah, thank you, Irina. I'm also just, um going to call out a couple of the responses that I saw in the chat from Ella and from Megan about um, the stylized Aztec faces that we see um, gridded throughout this entire um, portrait. Just that, um, and this is, I think, really important to remember with this piece that, you know, we've got these five leaders that um, are portrayed here. We know who they are. We've got their names. Um, and yet we have all of these other unnamed faces um, of people who very likely, right, um, given the fact that we are talking about um, social justice in this portrait, that all of these other faces, all of these other people were part of this movement. Um, and we have leaders and leaders are great, but we also need all of the other people who stand behind the leaders and also do the work as well. I think this piece would be completely different um, if we didn't have those Aztec faces and this gritting pattern um, and these smaller faces making up these larger faces, as everyone has said um, over um, over this conversation. I, as you know, Irina, I just love this piece. Um, and I did just note in the chat too that I have this um, portrait as a teaching poster as well. So I would be happy to um, send that along to, um, to everyone as well. But to move us right along, um, I'm going to skip ahead and um, take us to this portrait. Um, which is called Cherry, um, and it is by the artist um, Narcisa Martinez. Um, and this portrait is on view right now um, at the Portrait Gallery in the Outwind 2022 American Portraiture Today. As I mentioned, um, this portrait is part of our triennial portrait competition. Um, so as we did with the return to Aslan with Irina, let's take a few moments and note our initial observations about this work in the chat. So what do you see? What do you observe um, with this particular work? And as you're looking and as you're typing, I would encourage you to think about those elements of portrayal that we talked about at the top of this program. So everything from medium, right, the materials used to create this portrait, um, to the pose of our subject, the clothing that our subject is wearing, the colors that stand out to us, and maybe the colors that don't, um, the size, how much space, right, our subject is taking up. Is there a setting in this portrait? What objects do we see? So I'm seeing a uh, Thoughts coming through in the chat. Um, it looks like it's a drawing on a flattened cardboard box. Why, yes, yes, it is. 
Um, but it's a whole lot of materials, right? It's, you know, it's ink, it's gouache, there's um, metallic paint. Um, there's a whole lot of materials that are being used to create this likeness um, of the individual. Um, Erica, yes, the mask is powerful because it evokes um, it evokes emotion in us looking at it um, because we, when we see masks now, we are automatically, we associate that with the, um, with the pandemic. Um, this is a realistic likeness, um, right? The red of the cherries, it pops right on either side, um, but then also at the bottom of the portrait as well. Irina, what else are you seeing? Yeah, I'm noticing in the chat, right, that people are kind of pointing out what was already on the box and what the artist has added to the box. Um, and I think, I think it's interesting to kind of decipher between the two, right? Um, Ella says, I find it interesting that they kept the sticker for the cherry um, box on, right? So you can see stickers, you can see stamps from the box, right? Um, you can see on, on both left and right sides um, that printing of the word cherries um, on the box. Right. Every time I look at um, at this portrait, I am struck by um, just what we've been talking about. What is what was already there and what has been painted on and the place that my eye always goes to is um, the arm, right? Um, and then the elbow on the other side because Wow, it is just amazing um, the the artistic skill, right? To be able to sort of blend what was there with what is there now, um, it's really it's it's quite breathtaking. And I would encourage you if you are local that you should definitely go see this portrait um, in person. Um, but we do see a lot of red, right? Um, the hands are standing out. The hands are meant to represent or meant to frame, um, meant to frame the face. Okay. So let's let's begin to um, sort of make interpretations about this work, but also connect it to um, to to ourselves. So um, this is sort of the the think and the me and the me part of this. So how can we begin to um, analyze this piece? Maybe given our own entrance narrative, given what we know, given the conversation that we just had about the return to Aslan, um, but also what sorts of connections can we make between what we see here, this portrait called Cherry in our own lives. What sorts of connections can we make between us and this subject, this portrait, the fact that the artist is creating this portrait? What sorts of connections can we make? Yeah, Ella, I was thinking about the same thing, about the face behind the food you buy at the grocery store, right? Um, when I go to the grocery store many times, I don't see the box that the food comes in. I definitely don't know how it got there or who who harvested or planted um, the food that I'm eating. Um, so it's almost it almost is representing to me, right, what what I'm missing about how how I get my food um, with that box. Yeah. 
Um, and then this idea, right, of, um, of working during the pandemic, uh, being considered um, an essential worker, again, because we are making that connection between um, the, the bandana, the mask um, that our subject is wearing, and of course, the fact that this portrait was created in, um, in 2020. Yeah, Deborah, that's a really interesting um, observation. So um, his arms are faded out over the sides of the box, and it looks like perhaps the the worker behind our food is invisible to to us. Okay. So I think that we're already starting to do this, but we're we're connecting uh, um we're connecting this portrait to ourselves but now let's connect it to the bigger picture um and to do that i actually want to bring uh, um the return to aslan back in um so what sorts of connections can we make between these two portraits and then how do these connections or how do these portraits connect to a much bigger picture the lofty question i know Right, so we have a connection, right, between um, Huerta and Chavez, um, activists for farm workers, and then we have the farm worker represented in the work, Cherry. Um, Erica says exploitation of people. Yeah, we definitely see that um, in, in the work, Cherry. I think it's interesting to write that um, that the work on the right was created in 2020 and the return to Aslan, Irina, 2015? No, 2006. 2006. Okay, so 2006. And yet the stories that um, the artist is representing really are from from much earlier, right, um, in a span of time. So when we look at these two works, we are we are seeing almost a um, is it a single story over time? Is it multiple stories over time? How how are we connecting? Um, you know these two these two pieces. And how do we use these portraits to connect to bigger issues of today? I think, right, we've sort of, we sort of talked about this a few minutes ago, right? But the pandemic definitely brought into view how important, um, right, the food was and how we consume food and um, the line, right, how we get our food. Um, and so that definitely mm -hmm. makes, and the cherry, right, that brings it into focus right away. It was painted in 2020. So also the connection there into the return to Aslan. Yeah, and I, I was thinking about the, um, the the unnamed um faces that we were talking about with the return to aslan um and while our figure on the right is unnamed right um you know narciso martinez is certainly trying to shed a light on um an untold story um on a hidden story that is still very much um you know, something that is still being fought for um, 
today, right? Even as much as it was um, with Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta with the United Farm Workers. Um, so I think that there, right, there's this, there are these connections, like small connections, but bigger story connections that um, that we can begin to to make between the two. Right, and Ella, as you're pointing out, um, right, it's so important to talk about um, the leaders, but it's also important to talk about um, all of the people who um, are part of the struggle, who are on the front lines, who um, are marching right along with those with those leaders. And I think that's one of the connections that we can begin to make between these two pieces as well. So given our time, um, I want to move us right along. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Irina. Sounds great. So in wrapping up this workshop, uh, we wanted to give you a chance to take a look at the portraits that we have featured for the Our Struggle for Justice campaign project. Um, take a look at that collection of portraits and choose a portrait that inspires you. So choose a portrait that pulls you in somehow, whether it's the story behind it or um, the portrait itself, um, how it's painted or drawn. Um, and then with that portrait, think about how you might use it to inspire action in your students. So I am going to put a link in the chat now. This is a link to the Learning Lab collection, um, the Our Struggle for Justice Learning Lab collection. Um, and in this collection, you'll see about 20 portraits um, that you can look at. So find one that inspires you. Um, and then for the next seven-ish minutes, we'll, um, we'll kind of, let everyone off on their own to look at these portraits and how how this portrait might inspire action in your students and then we'll come back together um, and wrap up the program. Yeah, we'll come back together at 555. We just want to be, um, we want to honor everybody's time. So take five minutes, take a look at the collection um, that Irina popped into the chat. And find a piece that um, you love that inspires you, but also that you think will inspire your students too.
Shall we, Irene? Yes, let's do it. So I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put the Learning Lab collection up um, just so everybody can see that while you're asking. Sounds good. So take about, uh, take a few more seconds to wrap up whatever you're thinking or writing down. Um, and we would love for you in the chat, if you want to share what portrait you thought would be inspiring, um, we would love to hear what you thought. And if you are comfortable um, sharing how you think that can inspire civic action among your students. You can also, too, if you are at all interested, um, raise your hand and unmute yourself. Um, it's always nice to hear people talking as well. Why don't we start with everyone um, just noting in the chat what portrait inspires you? Erica, would you be interested in saying more? <laughs> uh, sure. Um, I try to make it a point to have a diversity of people represented in my classroom, I always consciously think about having people who represent my students. Um, but Ida B. Wells is one of my like heroines in history. And we, we refer to that portrait often for inspiration when we think about all of the bravery um, that she exemplified. Um, so I already used that one, but I have to say that Eleanor Roosevelt portrait really spoke to me through this yeah. gallery too it's hard to choose just one but to me that was inspiring like it just reminded me of like hard working you know I don't know that I just like that one a lot yeah thank you um for sharing and I should also point out that um this project is ongoing um so we will continue to add to this learning lab collection um those um, guiding essential questions um, and portraits. Um, Irina, what, until uh, for another that, couple of months? Yeah, until January or February of 2023. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, what, other, what other portraits did we have pop into the chat? Ooh, Shirley yeah, Chisholm. Yeah, Shirley Chisholm, that's a great portrait talking about elections and her candidacy. I love that connection. Yes. And Rosa Parks, definitely another connection, right, to present day. Excellent. Oh, and um, Gabrielle says uh, the Gloria Steinem and Dorothy Pittman Hughes photograph, um, which happens to be one of my favorites in our collection. And I might just add that the portrait that is in um, this Our Struggle for Justice project dates from, I don't know, Irina, when is it? Like early 1970s. 70, yeah. um, but Steinem and Pittman Hughes came together just a few years ago and recreated the photograph. Um, and we have that in, um, in our collection as well. It's, it's so great. <laughs> 